We are live. All right. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon or evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first session of the VCBH um, conference. Um, I'm Jennifer Tidy. I'm a uh, professor of behavioral and social sciences uh, mm -hmm. at the Brown University School of Public Health, where I'm also associate dean for research. Um, and as I said, I'm just thrilled to be opening up the conference. Um, this is always a fantastic conference. And this year I'm particularly excited about um, bringing together uh, tobacco control and tobacco regulatory scientists. Um, we have a terrific um, session, some important topics and some exciting speakers. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, uh, some housekeeping. Um, the chat function uh, is live. Uh, you can jump on it, um, put in questions, um, put in questions at any time during the Q&A section. Uh, the speakers won't see them. They'll be visible to me and they'll be visible at the end, I believe. Um, the session's being recorded and will be posted to the VCBH website and a YouTube tube channel for on-demand viewing following our conference. Um, yeah, so each speaker will present and then a Q&A discussion will follow at the end. So we're, we're gonna hold off questions to the end after our fourth speaker. And I think that's about it for, um, for housekeeping. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Amanda Graham. Uh, Dr. Graham has the very cool title of Chief of Innovations at the Truth Initiative in Washington, DC. Uh, she is also adjunct professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic and adjunct pr professor of oncology at the Georgetown University School of Medicine. She's internationally recognized as a thought leader in web and mobile smoking cessation interventions and in online social networks. In collaboration with partners at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Graham led the development of the X program, an enterprise digital smoking cessation platform designed for employees and health plans. And this is Quitting, a first of its kind quit vaping program for teens and young adults. And she will be talking to us today about digital interventions. Um, thank you and take it away, Amanda. All right, let me get my screen shared here. All right, I trust you all are seeing an orange screen. Is that good? Thumbs up? Super, great. Thanks, Jen, for that introduction. And good to see you, former colleague of mine at Brown University. Uh, it's been a while. Um, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really an honor to certainly follow Senator Leahy's remarks and to be speaking alongside the other distinguished speakers uh, on the agenda, both this morning on this panel and over the full two days. Um, as Jen mentioned, my talk's going to review the state of the science around digital interventions for tobacco cessation and where there are strong signals of population impact. Just by way of disclosure, uh, we run a number of programs at Truth Initiative that are freely available as part of our nonprofit public health mission. Um, and we've expanded that work to generate revenue that goes back into supporting our work. Uh, we partner with employers, states, health plans uh, to deliver enterprise versions of those programs. Um, and those partners help us disseminate uh, tobacco cessation interventions to their populations of smokers. So I just wanted to make that explicit. So we are all acutely aware of the ways that the pandemic has changed the way that we internet. Uh, certainly as we dialed into yet another Zoom meeting and virtual conference this morning, um, there's now broad awareness that we rely on the internet really as a core utility that we depend on in virtually all aspects of our lives. The pandemic has brought that into really sharp focus. These are data from the Pew Research Center on the right um, that show that actually over the past year, the proportion of US adults that use the internet had the largest increase in over a decade, up three percentage points to an all-time high of 93%. 
The pandemic has also massively accelerated the adoption of digital health tools and investment in digital health. And that's really what this slide shows. What had been a relatively steady rate of growth in venture funding, uh, both in terms of total dollars of funding and also the number of deals um, really exploded in 2020 and 2021. You can see that on the right-hand side of this chart. And what this shows is the central role that digital interventions had to play in healthcare during the pandemic, um, but also the ongoing role that they're expected to play going forward. When we think about the real potential for digital interventions to impact tobacco use at a population level, and we've heard all the reasons that we need to really focus on population-based interventions this morning already, it really comes down to their advantage in terms of reach. This is probably an equation that's familiar to, to all of you dialed in. Several meta-analyses have shown that digital interventions can actually yield the same quit rates as traditional face-to-face -face interventions and telephonic interventions. Um, but with uh, much broader reach, what it means is that there's real potential to help just larger numbers of tobacco users to quit each year. So technology, digital, that can mean lots of different things. Um, trackers, wearables, telehealth, the internet of things, uh, interventions that are anchored around the electronic health record, I could go on. But for the purpose of this particular talk, I'm gonna be covering what I think are the four types of digital interventions that are most relevant to tobacco cessation. So the first is web-based interventions. Uh, these programs have been around for over 20 years and not surprisingly have a very robust evidence base behind them now. Uh, there have been numerous systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have shown the effectiveness of web-based interventions in increasing smoking cessation. Uh, this is a recommendation from a recommended modality um, in the most recent Surgeon General's report, which highlighted uh, programs that contain behavior change techniques that have been shown to be effective and programs that leverage the interactivity of the internet. Um, another advantage of web-based programs, they're obviously scalable. They can serve 100,000 people as easily as they serve 100, uh, especially during a pandemic. Um, they can deliver real-time tailored information uh, to deliver a dynamic intervention that changes over the course of a smoker's journey um, as they move through the quitting process. Really unique to web-based interventions, they can provide 24-7 support right at the time that someone needs help. Um, some of you may have seen a really interesting discussion on the SRNT listserv recently about relapse that happens well after somebody has been quit, even five years. Um, and certainly the availability, the sustainability of web-based programs for whenever somebody needs to reconnect with treatment is an advantage. And I'll just say, uh, as, as Jen mentioned, we run a number of digital interventions and we've seen relatively steady traffic uh, throughout the course of the pandemic with people reaching out to stay connected to the quitting process. Also unique to web-based interventions are online social networks. Um, we know that tobacco users come to an online community for a whole host of reasons. Some people are looking to crowdsource they, their quit. Uh, they wanna hear how other people have done it, what has worked. Um, most are looking for empathy, compassion, support, cheerleading, um, the things that they may not get from other people in their life uh, who don't understand why they can't just stop. Um, in a randomized trial of about 5,300 people that we did uh, five or six years ago, what we found is that tobacco users who were active in an online community were more than twice as likely to be abstinent um, at a nine-month long-term follow-up as those who did not participate in the community. Uh, the effect was strongest for those who contributed, those who generated new content, and those who responded and interacted with other people um, within the community. Really interestingly, we also saw that even just lurking or reading other people's posts increased the odds of quitting. And we saw an independent perspective um, that, that online community use, staying active for a longer period of time was an independent and prospective predictor of abstinence. 
So that's around the effectiveness. When we look at reach, uh, this was a question that a colleague of mine, Mike Amato, and I were interested in answering. And uh, the HINTS data set from the National Cancer Institute really was the perfect tool to address this question. Um, and we, we looked at 12 years of data, um, five waves that span 2005 to 2017. Uh, and what we found was that the percentage of smokers who searched online for quit smoking information in 2005 was about 16%, which translated to roughly 7 million smokers. Um, but by seven, 2017, that had increased up to over a third, uh, which represented 12, over 12 million smokers. Hopefully, hints, other data sets uh, will give us the ability to take a look at this to see um, how the pandemic has influenced this, but we can imagine uh, that both the proportion and the number of tobacco users looking online to, to, to get help quitting has increased. Messaging uh, is the second intervention modality that I wanna focus on this morning. Um, and here too, we have very strong evidence about its effectiveness. There have been numerous systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have shown that text messages are effective especially when they're interactive and they're tailored to the responses that are received back from participants. Um, and we know that this is an extremely cost-effective and scalable modality um, from studies that have been done literally across the globe. In terms of the reach of text messaging, uh, mobile ownership is in the US at least is now at about 97%. And this won't surprise anybody, texting is the most common cell phone activity. Uh, now the most used form of communication for adults in the U.S. under 50. The human response to text messaging is, is quite Pavlovian. I think we've all experienced this. We open 99% of text messages. We read the vast majority of them within just three minutes. We respond extremely rapidly to about half of all the messages that, that we receive. And so this is we say in our front pocket, ubiquitously available, the first thing that most of us open when we wake up in the morning. Um, and so this is a powerful way to leverage technology that is already fully embedded in most people's lives. What we hear from participants in trials and from the programs themselves is really the striking impact of ultimately what are very short snippets of content. Um, at their core, text messages seem to remind smokers of a commitment that they've made around quitting at a particular point in time. Um, they, they remind people of their goals and their commitment to take that big step. There's, there's also this somewhat surprising sense of support that we hear about as smokers move through the ups and downs of quitting. Um, even though they know the messages are coming from an automated program, they describe feeling less alone, that someone's in their corner, that someone's checking in on them. Um, and certainly the practical tips and advice uh, are the nuts and bolts of what help people uh, tackle the process of quitting. The third technology that I wanna cover um, is smartphone apps. And here we have a proliferation of programs um, but not yet of scientific evidence. If you've ever searched in the app store for a quit smoking app and now a quit vaping app, um, you've likely found yourself scrolling endlessly through dozens upon dozens uh, of apps. Despite their proliferation, um, what we've seen is that the science has really lagged behind and the Surgeon General's report concluded that to date, there's inadequate evidence to infer that, um, that apps are effective at increasing smoking cessation. There have been a number of reviews of the content and quality of smartphone apps, um, and generally they've led to the same conclusions. This first one dates back to 2013, led by Lori and Abrams. Uh, and what they found was that the majority of apps were not consistent with recommendations from the clinical practice guidelines, um, Bettina Hepner and her team uh, found that there were few apps that, that deliver content that is individually tailored to the user. Their conclusion is that smartphone apps are actually not particularly smart. Um, and most recently, while there are some scientifically vetted apps that are available to consumers, they're enormously difficult to find, um, just given the hundreds of apps that are available in the App Store. 
That's not to say um, that there is no evidence. Um, there's some very promising work demonstrating that the evidence base is building. Uh, Jonathan Bricker and his team at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center recently published a very rigorous trial in JAMA Internal Medicine showing the effectiveness of a mobile app uh, centered around acceptance and commitment therapy. And there have been other uh, very promising formative, uh, formative studies that have been published, pilot studies, and trials that are underway. So I think the bottom line here is that this is definitely an area to watch. And then the last technology I want to talk about is chatbots. Um, these are sometimes referred to as conversational agents, relational agents, um, because the intent is really to take that power of messaging and short messaging, um, but to create or, or to mimic a trusted human relationship through the exchange of a much more naturalistic feeling set of messages delivered by a fully automated program. Um, chatbots can range in complexity. Uh, at the one end, there are fairly simple implementations where the user is actually given um, a response to select. You can see the screenshot, um, the option uh, says, let's do this. I had not selected that yet. Um, and so once I select, let's do this, the next message that comes back um, has some additional text and a queue with three other responses for me to choose from. It's very similar to the experience of text messaging and to some of the back and forth um, that is baked into text messaging programs. Um, but the decision trees, the depth of the exchange with chatbots typically goes well beyond typical text messaging programs, which may have a back and forth, you know, two, three, four times. At the other end of the spectrum is Florence. Uh, this is an embodied artificial intelligence program from the World Health Organization. Uh, Florence provides real-time emotional responses. Her facial expressions are appropriate. Uh, she's capable of responding to pro processing and responding to audio, to video, to text, um, to create the experience of what might be uh, analogous to a, an in-person interaction. This was launched in July of 2020. Um, the World Health Organization is doing a lot of work to disseminate this program. I'm not sure that it's been evaluated yet. And so this will be interesting to see as the evidence comes out, what we learn um, from this kind of approach to uh, using technology in a much richer form uh, to try and mimic what we've done face-to-face uh, -face and telephonically for decades. So as I mentioned, uh, these are the four technologies that are most commonly deployed for tobacco cessation, but there are many, many, many others that are available today. And as digital health continues to expand, there will be opportunities to marry our behavior change theories and techniques and interventions with new technologies. Um, and so before I move into this next section, I wanted to highlight a really great commentary that was published uh, in JMIR in 2019 that cautioned academics to resist discarding or overlooking proven established technologies in favor of the newest technology trend. Um, the paper focused on text messaging, which is obviously a very basic no frills approach uh, to delivering intervention content. And they showcase example statements that they've heard from colleagues, from people at, in the tobacco control space. It's, it works, but it's not shiny enough. We need an app. Um, I want to fund something that's much more impressive, like a robot. Uh, and so in, in building interventions, we should be wary of the tendency to chase the latest fashion technology buzzwords um, and make sure that we're staying focused on the needs, the preferences, the realities of the tobacco users that we're trying to both reach and engage with our treatments. All right, I will step off the soapbox, uh, transition gears here to talk about a digital intervention uh, called This Is Quitting that we launched in January of 19 to address the youth vaping epidemic. Um, very briefly, we went with text messaging over other kinds of technologies for a few simple reasons. First and foremost, this is how kids prefer to communicate. Um, there were actually some kids in our formative work who would only communicate by text message with us. And it can be used anonymously and discreetly. Um, so kids don't have to disclose to an adult, to their friends, that they're vaping, that they're quitting. Uh, this is something that they can do on their own. 
Uh, the program is called This is Quitting, as I mentioned. It's grounded in uh, the best evidence that we have for to be treating tobacco addiction uh, among youth and young adults. And it delivers practical evidence-based advice on how to quit, tailored by age, the device someone's using, and their quit date. Um, we designed it to be highly interactive. And really what's unique about the program are the messages from other young people um, that we've gathered and baked into the program that tell young people they're not the only one quitting and that other young people are being successful. We launched, as I mentioned, in 2019. We were thrilled to see about 2,000 young people enroll within the first 24 hours. That's that first little blip on the graph. Um, but then the real signal of demand came about 12 days later. Uh, this was when Mashable ran a story on their Snapchat channel about our program, and we had 22,000 people enroll within 24 hours. Um, and this is a letter that we published in Nicotine and Tobacco Research about the development of the program and these, these early results. Later in 2019, we integrated uh, the program into the Truth Campaign to leverage the reach of the Truth brand to young people uh, across the US. These are uh, data as of two days ago. Um, what you can see is that to date, we've had over 379,000 young people enroll. Uh, it's roughly a 60-40 split um, favoring young adults, uh, 237,000 young adults, 142,000 teens. Um, what we continue to see throughout the program is that the vast majority set a quit date. Um, most of them set a quit date for the day they enroll. Um, about half use um, what are extra support keywords to get messages beyond the scheduled message messages delivered by the program, and 67% complete the full three-month program. I just wanted to give you a sense of the user feedback we get. We have an inbox, like a, you know, like an email inbox, but it's a text message inbox, and we have dozens of unsolicited messages that we get every day. Um, these are our warm fuzzies. Uh, this is on a day-to-day -day basis what tells us that we're making an impact. Um, young people texting in to say, this really helps a lot. Uh, thank you so much. I've never felt so supported. They know it's an automated program. Uh, thank you, robot. It's nice to have someone to discuss the horrible realities of nicotine withdrawal. Um, and the, the bubbles on the right uh, are kind of themes that have come out of this that they like that the messages are from real people, that they, they've got somebody in their corner. And uh, it's a reminder to not vape because vaping can be so reflexive and automatic. Uh, we conducted a randomized trial uh, among young adults. We were fortunate to have funding from the CVS Health Foundation to do this. Uh, this was a two-arm trial that compared this is quitting to an assessment only control uh, with the primary endpoint at seven months post randomization. Um, we had a pretty comprehensive uh, retention strategy, happy to talk about that later, but it resulted in 75% follow-up across both arms, um, even with an assessment-only control, so we were pleased to see that. Um, and our protocol paper um, was published uh, in JMIR back in May. Um, so we recruited online from December uh, 2019 to 2020. Um, and uh, these are the eligibility criteria. And the important thing to know is uh, that we decided to white label the intervention. Obviously with the intervention embedded within the truth campaign, we wanted to make sure that we were evaluating the independent effect of the program um, separate and aside from the messaging that they would get from the truth campaign, which only starts after they've completed, um, this is quitting, but that's the, the white labeling on this slide. Very briefly, I want to give you a sense of the sample characteristics so that you have those in mind as I present the main outcomes. Um, we randomized 2,588 young adults uh, in the trial. Again, that recruitment spanned about three and a half months. Um, the sample was diverse demographically. We saw about a third uh, reporting that they were not meeting basic expenses. We saw strong signals of dependence. We administered multiple me measures of dependence, um, numerous previous quit attempts, and a third that reported past 30 day smoking. And maybe not surprisingly for this age group, um, very high rates of other substance use um, in terms of past 30 day marijuana use, binge drinking. 
And we saw between 35 and 44% who screened positive either for uh, depression or anxiety. Under ITT analysis, um, part participants randomized to this is quitting were roughly 40% more likely to be abstinent at that seven month endpoint. Again, this is a 30 day abstinence metric. Um, we saw the same magnitude of results under complete case analysis. Uh, and this was published in JAMA Internal Medicine um, in May of this year. We were really interested to see if there were certain groups that did better than others. Um, and so these are the variables that we looked at. It spanned a, a host of demographic characteristics, tobacco use characteristics, particularly of interest was nicotine dependence, um, and then these other substance use and mental health uh, variables. There were no statistically significant findings, even at a more relaxed uh, P less than 0.1 significance threshold, um, both under intent to treat and under complete case. Uh, very excited to announce we launched a similar trial among teens, 13 to 17 last Friday. Um, you can see the eligibility criteria here. Uh, we're recruiting through Facebook and Instagram when it's not down. Uh, a unique element of this trial, obviously, is that we're working with minors. Um, and so we've assembled a data safety and monitoring board um, who will have oversight of the trial in addition to the IRB. We've included a decisional capacity um, element as part of informed consent and been approved to have a waiver of parental consent with that uh, in, our, in our informed consent process. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, as of yesterday, we've enrolled about 196 teens, um, averaging about 50 a day. So we're hoping uh, to continue at that clip and um, with a sample target sample size of 3,000 maybe to be done before the end of the year. So just a few thoughts to wrap up. Um, the role of technology in tobacco cessation will only continue to increase um, as our current generation of digital natives gets older and as steps uh, to ensure that everyone is connected to the internet as a basic utility are implemented. Um, we know new technologies will constantly emerge. And so our challenge as behavioral scientists is really to stay focused on what we know works to drive behavior change um, and what we know is effective for treating tobacco dependence um, and be intrigued by bling, um, but to be deliberate and thoughtful in the selection of the right technology for the right audience, for the right purpose um, to maximize both reach and effectiveness and ultimately um, our impact. So I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, and with that, I guess I turn it back um, to Jen. Great, thank you, Amanda. Um, let's see, are you still sharing? Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna hold questions to the end. Please type them in the Q&A box. We're getting some already, so that's exciting. Um, but right now I wanna turn things over to doc Dr. Christine Sheffer. Uh, Dr. Sheffer is a clinical psychologist, scientist, practitioner, and professor at the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, where she conducts research focusing on the biological and behavioral mechanisms involved with health behaviors, particularly tobacco dependence and other addictive behaviors. She leads the Biobehavioral Health and Recovery Laboratory and directs both the Roswell Park Tobacco Treatment Service and the research and evaluation for Roswell Park cessation services, which operates among other things, the New York State Smokers Quit Line. And she will be talking with us today about quit lines. Um, thank you, Christine. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna share my screen now and make sure. So can you see my my screen. Yep, with your notes. Okay. How's that? Better. Yep, good. And then next minute. I'm looking at notes again. Yeah, we are. Let's try this again. Okay. 
We good? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm so glad to see you all, and I'm really delighted to be here. So I'm going to provide a brief overview of some of the opportunities for innovations that might be utilized to leverage tobacco quit lines to further reduce cigarette smoking. I think much of what I'll talk about will complement Dr. Graham's wonderful talk, um, really informative. Um, and just a bit about me to give you some more context. You know, um, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm a clinician and a scientist. And my research is really focused on, you know, biobehavioral mechanisms uh, important to uh, tobacco and other addictions and other health behaviors. But quit lines have been a part of my professional life for most of my career. I started and ran the Arkansas quit line for several years when I was at the College of Public Health at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. And I've been at Roswell Park for almost five years now. Roswell Park is a division of the Department of Health Behavior here. Um, it was led by Mike Cummings previously and Andy Hyland for the past 10 years. And um, uh, Roswell Park developed one of the first quit lines in the country and has maintained operation of the New York State quit line for about 20 years. And we operate quit line services for several health insurance plans and employers. So I'm a member of the leadership team here. Um, we lead the research and evaluation component and provide input into clinical services and into um, developing innovations um, for our cessation services. So exploring opportunities for innovations you know, taking what's out there in the literature and um, seeing if we can apply it for with the quit lines has always been, you know, really exciting to me. And I hope you'll see why as we discuss some of these innovations. So I have no potential or actual conflicts of interest. Um, okay, first, let me give a little bit background about quit lines um, and the size of the quit line network, um, just so that we're all on the same page about this. Over the past 20 years, tobacco quit lines have become a mainstay of our tobacco control efforts. Quit lines now comprise the largest network of tobacco use treatment services in North America. So all the residents in, in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, each US territory, all 10 Canadian provinces and two territories all have access to publicly funded quit line services. In addition, there are specialized quit lines that are relatively high volume so um, Asian Smokers Quit Line and the Veterans Quit Line are, are two of those. In addition to that, there are many quit lines that serve health insurance plans and employers. And while there's no national quit line, there is a national quit line number that serves as a portal and links callers automatically to the state quit line services using their area code, kind of enhancing the network cap uh, capability of all these individual quit lines. So quit lines are undoubtedly an effective uh, vehicle to deliver evidence-based behavioral treatment and um, distribute nicotine replacement therapy. Traditional quit line services include coaching over the telephone, providing referrals, um, uh, mailing materials, and free nicotine replacement. Uh, media campaigns have been key to driving reach here, which um, traditionally has meant getting people to call the quit line. Quit lines have demonstrated unprecedented reach um, for, to, into the tobacco using population, but for any behavioral intervention um, over the past 20 years, uh, while it, it, 1% of the, the smoking population might not sound like a lot, it translates into hundreds of thousands of people a year and a lot of quitting activity. But recently, um, quit lines um, oh, well, recently quit lines reached a landmark of 10 million calls. I think that was this year. Um, okay, so nonetheless, there's a significant reduction in reach over the past seven to eight years. Call volume has decreased significantly to a high of maybe 1.3 million calls per year to less than a million calls a year. And most agree that innovation is needed to kind of increase reach and, cut and invigorate this network to ensure that it's maintained as a mainstay of our um, 
you know, national tobacco control. So um, one more bit of background, uh, just briefly, I think it might be important to understand the financial bit around Quitline's infrastructure to be able to discuss how Quitline innovations might be disseminated, disseminated because as you know, ultimately dissemination and implementation are key to innovations actually reaching you know, tobacco users. So quit lines are funded by contracts between individual states or other entities and quit line vendors. So at Roswell, we're, we're a vendor, right? And we are funded via a competitive contract with the state of New York to operate the New York State quit line. The largest quit lines, the state quit lines, are funded with multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts that are initiated most commonly with requests for proposals developed in state departments of health. So departments of health um, need to be aware of and value innovations for the innovation to kind of make it into the request for proposals. But ultimately the process of establishing quitline services and incorporating innovations involves more than that, multiple players, including state legislators, um, quitline vendors and uh, contract reviewers. For innovation uptake and dissemination, all of these folks need to be aware of and value, you know, an, an innovation. So one of the most notable innovations in the past 20 years was a redesign of the Minnesota Quit Plan Services. And this kind of laid the landscape for, for what's happening now. Um, prior to that effort, it was assumed that uh, the ultimate goal was getting people to talk to coaches on the telephone. Um, Clearway of Minnesota conducted a considerable formative research um, to redesign their, this approach. The result included traditional quitline telephone counseling and NRT, in addition to multiple options that did not require people to talk on the telephone. So um, a, a two-week starter kit of NRT without, without having to talk to a coach first, a standalone text messaging program, and printed self-help materials. So this was supported also by a media campaign that specifically addressed stigma um, smokers feel when seeking help. Um, uh, this um, approach increased reach by 480% compared to the year before the design was implemented. Questions about replicability were, were recently addressed in a study by Paula Keller. So, um, and this evidence indicates that offering a menu of options that can engage more uh, tobacco, can engage more cigarette smokers and significantly increase reach. And this idea here is that um, the service delivery needs to meet individuals' preferences for consuming and interacting with treatment information. Uh, this approach has been slowly making its way into requests for proposals and contracts and services uh, with the focus now on offering a menu of services. There are a lot of exciting opportunities for innovation, and many of these are focused on engagement and reach because of the clear need uh, given the, the reduction in call volumes lately. But some are focused also on increasing efficacy and, and, and providing novel treatment combinations. And I'll start with, uh, with reach and then talk about increasing efficacy. So significant opportunities for innovation um, lie in the development of novel media campaigns that drive cigarette smokers to quitline services. Media campaigns are probably going to be, be um, maintained as a mainstay for driving um, uh, cigarette smokers to quitline services. I think this will ultimately involve multiple media venues, though, that support multiple ways to link to different kinds of services. So the field is really wide open here in terms of creative health communications, but I want to mention one area of focus in particular. And I think we've all seen the um, hard hitting, sometimes uh, gut wrenching, you know, um, anti tobacco campaigns. And these were once fabulously successful at uh, driving calls to quit lines. But in recent years, the ability of these ads um, to generate quit line activity has diminished somewhat. At the same time, there's an increasing awareness that some of the messaging in these campaigns have perhaps unintentionally amplified the stigma associated with cigarette smoking. And I'm glad to talk more about that. Uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of another topic. Um, 
But right now, there's convergent evidence that indicates um, perceived and internalized stigma among individuals who smoke cigarettes about being a cigarette smoker is nearly universal and that it inhibits cigarette smoke or inhibits um, cessation efforts through yeah, concealment and social withdrawal and some other other ways too. Um, individuals who are already marginalized and experience stigma for other reasons might be particularly sensitive to the impact of stigma associated with um, cigarette smoking. Um, in a recent intervention trial conducted by Patrick Hammett, Stephen Fu and Diana uh, Burgess and colleagues, uh, low income individuals who smoke cigarettes who reported higher levels of baseline stigma were less likely to engage in, in smoking cessation in, uh, interventions. Stigma is also associated with misreporting smoking status to healthcare providers, particularly um, among hospitalized individuals who smoke and those with chronic medical conditions. Uh, Jamie Ostroff and her team have done considerable formative work here. But there's much to be done to gain a greater understanding of the role of stigma as a barrier for engaging in quitline services in particular, and the development of media messaging that minimizes rather than amplifies stigma and still activates folks to use um, uh, quitline services. So while providing NRT online might not sound like a tremendous intervention, innovation, it remains controversial for a lot of different reasons. And I think there's significant room for developing creative methods to make NRT available, ensure safety, and ensure that folks are using it appropriately without having to talk on the telephone with a coach, which seems to have become a barrier for some folks. So something else that might be garnered from widespread provision of NRT online or perhaps in other ways might be reducing the perception that these medications are harmful or addictive, which are commonly held beliefs. Um, easier access might bring perceptions of harm for these products um, in line with the actual risk of using these products, which is uh, quite low. Reducing this perception might also normalize use and actually increase the uptake of NRT from quit lines and other sources and um, you know, contribute to more quitting overall. So I'm going to put text messaging support, online cessation programs, and email support programs on the same basket because they're technology-based, automated, and pre-programmed. Although the greatest amount of activity, I think, has clearly been focused on text message messaging support programs, um, sparked by the success of several different programs, including the, the, the Truth Program and the Text to Quit um, program um, developed by Lorian Abrams and her team. I think some of the most innovative work here is, that's going on right now and, and will continue to go on is our, our theory-based and tailored-based approaches to echo um, what uh, Dr. Graham was saying. Um, some examples of, of applications with quit lines, Ben Toll and his group have been working with us to examine the effects of gain frame versus loss frame text um, using prospect theory. And we're currently testing an approach called um, learn to quit that's grounded in a manual driven cognitive behavioral approach. So it's kind of like following a, um, uh, an evidence based uh, CBT manual, but doing it via text. I think uh, applications of self determination theory might also be fruitful given the um, the kind of the, the folks who want to use these services um, uh, want, want to do things on their own. I think applications, um, okay, no, wait, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip to the next. Opportunities also include um, text and other uh, digital programs tailored for challenges that um, certain groups encounter, uh, like Dr. Abrams um, discussed. So like those with um, mental health conditions or those um, with uh, tailored with cultural elements that, that resonate for certain groups. 
I think also that programs such as these will be attractive to quitline funders because once these programs are developed and tested, they're relatively inexpensive to deliver and maintain, which is a, a, a significant plus for the folks who make decisions about, about these services. So, and for dissemination and implementation. So um, traditionally, web chat is a way to engage folks who are visiting a website. I'm sure you've encountered it as a consumer. Um, and Dr. Um, Graham kind of discussed discussed it sort of. Uh, there, the bots are a, 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 like a more enhanced version of this. But um, it's when a little box pops up when you're on uh, shopping on a website um, like Lowe's or something. It is a simple online chat box that's accessible because there's no special software needed for shoppers or in the case of quit lines or tobacco users um, or others visiting uh, the, the quit line website. So web chat can be used to answer questions, direct folks to different services and provide support and information and keep folks interacting with information on the website. Most are partially automated, so there doesn't have to be a coach on the other end all the time typing in every response. Programming is used to, to provide quick, simple support or direction uh, via libraries of keywords and special algorithms. For quit lines, these libraries might be used to identify individuals in need of certain uh, like motivation or self-efficacy or, 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 or certain types of information or links to different types of services. You know, and this is in addition to the, the, um, the ability of tobacco users to be able to communicate that they would like to talk to, a, um, a, to chat with a coach directly. Uh, I think there's also lots of opportunities for innovation with text-based or web-based coaching. Um, the software programs that enable these types of communication are often specially designed to ensure privacy and confidentiality. Many times users need to download a program, uh, but uh, apparently not always. Um, nonetheless, at the moment, we have no evidence about how to best provide um, behavioral and, uh, interventions or coaching in this medium. Um, which is admittedly somewhat um, limited in, for, in, in the types of communications that you can provide. There's a tremendous potential here, though, in understanding how this option might increase overall reach, as well as reach into certain groups, you know, such as youth or, um, or uh, other folks who don't want to talk on the, the telephone. Um, this, of course, is in addition to examining the efficacy of treatment delivered in this way, which uh, there's a lot to be done um, there, too. So opportunities for innovation also lie in the proliferation of mobile applications by quit lines. Um, as Dr. Graham mentioned, there's a huge number of them out there, but very little in terms of the science behind them. Um, I think that some of the um, more innovative approaches or ones that will show um, efficacy uh, will particularly be uh, theory driven um, based approaches and products that integrate other treatment modalities within that that application. So it's not just a standalone thing, it's connected to um, other quitline services or service options provided by quitlines. One of the most exciting mobile applications on the market, in my opinion, at the moment is called um, Clicoteam by Click Therapeutics. Uh, this product guides users through a personalized quit plan teaches um, CBT-based strategies, which I was um, delighted to see, and um, solicit support from people the users identify in their social circle. But one of the most exciting things to me is the portal where the quit line or the other sponsor can track and analyze aggregate data 
uh, from users and estimate healthcare and other savings um, from the, the population of users. Departments of Health and other sponsors uh, might find this of particular value. Um, I have both, I co of the yellow and colleagues have published some preliminary evidence um, for efficacy about this product. So in terms of innovations focused on increasing the effic efficacy of treatment delivered by quit lines, um, we now know that certain groups don't benefit equally from our standard approaches. Um, there's some exciting efforts to address this situation as well as increase the repertoire of treatments in our treatment arsenal, um, sort of um, providing a, uh, um, a, a large menu or smorgasbord of, of, um, of options for folks uh, is the goal here. For, for an, one example, we're working with Judith Gordon uh, to examine the use of guided imagery um, that is delivered over the telephone um, uh, to improve um, cessation outcomes. There's also some exciting new methods to decrease delay discounting and increase prospection um, via interventions delivered remotely by technology, by a quit line. And I'm glad to talk some more about these at, at any time. These are grounded in decades of neurobiological and neuroeconomic evidence that greater delay discounting rates are linked with poor treatment outcomes. And they focus on decreasing delay discounting, broadening the temporal window uh, within which the rewards and benefits of cessation are valued. Our team is working with Jeff Stein, Warren Bickle, and others to test remote delivery of episodic future thinking via the quit line and combining episodic future thinking with remote contingency management. We're also examining other another um, intervention called future thinking priming, um, which uh, has the same goals in mind. So delivering remotely via delivered remotely via technology, you know, these interventions have found to be effective at improving outcomes. Um, uh, many of these approaches are also likely to be relatively low cost to deliver, uh, you know, similar to um, text messaging programs. So finally, a chronic issue that plagues many digital therapeutics, whether the goal is increasing reach or efficacy, is um, diminishing engagement. People stop looking at texts or the app or emails or the website. And uh, the evidence to this point is pretty clear that, and, and makes sense, that increased engagement improves outcome. And there's significant opportunities here for innovation in the development of methods to keep users engaged. I think um, behavioral scientists are particularly well is, is positioned to contribute to these intervent interventions with creative applications of existing behavioral approaches. Uh, contingency management for engagement, of course, is one. Uh, the use of remote personal CO monitors is another. Lori Abrams, um, whose team developed the Baby and Me program, is having um, success with a remotely delivered contingency management approach that uses personal CO monitors with pregnant women. They developed the approach as a redesign um, of their in-person approach in response to the pandemic. So in early 2020, they partnered with Covita, um, I mean, the bed font monitors, and a, and a company called Vincere that developed a dashboard that integrates patient goals, data from personal CO monitors, and compensation. Um, others are working to enhance uh, engagement with text messaging programs and other technologies by integrating quizzes with points as rewards or other reinforcements as 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 being key. It, I think some of these things are are, are key to being more um, interactive and and that can enhance engagement while maintaining the self determination of users who are likely to re use these um, remote services. So um, I'm afraid that's all I have today. Uh, thank you, audience, who I cannot see. <laughs> and, 
uh, Stephen Higgins and his team for organizing this conference. Um, it's been fun and inspirational for me to be able to discuss all of these innovations in the context of how they might be leveraged by the, the huge network of quit lines to reach more individuals who smoke cigarettes. It would be great if utilizing these innovations, we could reach more than 1% of cigarette smokers per year. But please let me know if you'd like to discuss any of these ideas or any other ideas. Always glad to brainstorm and you know work with new uh, collaborations. Wonderful, thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, so if you want to stop sharing, and uh, I will introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Jamie Hartman Boyce. Um, Dr. Hartman Boyce is a senior research fellow and departmental lecturer with the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. Her research mainly consists of evidence synthesis work, and her particular interests lie in the communication of complex information and data to inform policy and public action. Uh, she leads the Cochrane Review of Electronic Cigarettes for Smoking Cessation, which is now a living review, which is very exciting, um, funded by the Cancer Research UK and updated monthly. And she's an editor for the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group. And she also supervises student research and teaches uh, critical appraisal and evidence synthesis method methodology at the undergraduate and graduate levels. And the title of her presentation is E-Cigarettes for Smoking Cessation, the Latest Cochrane Evidence. Great, thank you so much. I'm assuming you can see my screen okay. Wonderful, yes. lovely. So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, just to start off with, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. This work is funded by Cancer Research UK. It's also supported by the National Institute for Health Research, which is the research arm of the UK's National Health Service. But one thing I do want to acknowledge is how grateful I am to the author team on this Living Systematic Review. It is no small piece of work and we're really grateful to all of the people on board who help out um, and make this work possible. So for anyone unfamiliar with Cochrane, we are a global nonprofit uh, and we basically exist to gather and combine research evidence to determine the benefits and risks of healthcare treatments and interventions by conducting systematic reviews. Cochrane reviews are typically rather large, uh, very detailed documents. Our methods are considered gold standard, and we have a really strong emphasis in quality assessments. It's not just what does the evidence show, but also how much can we trust it. Cochrane at the moment is organized by topic-specific review groups. So I work with the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Review Group at the University of Oxford, where I review lots of things relating to tobacco addiction, e-cigarettes being one of them. And the reason we put out these reviews is really to help people who are making decisions about tobacco control measures and interventions and tobacco addiction treatments do so with the best available evidence to hand. So our reviews tend to be used quite a lot by healthcare providers, by people who smoke, by researchers, funders, and often by policymakers and guideline developers as well. Now, Cochrane reviews, none of them are particularly static documents, but this one changes quite a bit because it is a living systematic review. So we first published this review back in 2014. We updated it in 2016. We then updated it again in 2020. And in that gap between 2016 and 2020, lots of new evidence came out, which we knew would really impact the review's conclusions, but we simply didn't have the resource in our team to update the review at that time. So we're really grateful to Cancer Research UK who funded us for two years to make this a living systematic review. And what that means is that every month we search all sorts of databases, including um, your standard publication ones, but also gray literature sources for new evidence. Whatever new evidence we find that's relevant to the review, we publish monthly, just saying these are the studies we found. And whenever new data emerges that might really change the meaning of anything we have, so that might change, strengthen, or weaken existing conclusions, or relate to new comparisons or outcomes, we trigger an update of the reviews. So that means all of the analyses get updated, all of the text gets updated. So as part of that project, just to flag up, we put out briefing documents and update them every month, one aimed at people who smoke and one aimed at policymakers and clinicians. And for anyone who's really into e-cigarette research, my colleague, Dr. Nicola Linson and I also produce a monthly podcast where we interview people about the research that we found. So 
The review update that I am going to be presenting the results from today published towards the end of last month and it incorporates uh, evidence found up to the 1st of May 2020, which is five new included studies since our last review update in April. In terms of our inclusion criteria for this review, we're very much interested in the use of e-cigarettes to help people quit smoking. So we're interested in people who are defined as current smokers at enrollment into the study and they can be motivated or unmotivated to quit. In terms of study types, when we first started out this review, we were looking at three different study designs. So back in 2014, we included randomized controlled trials where people who smoked were randomized to an e-cigarette intervention or control, uncontrolled intervention studies in which everyone in the study was offered some sort of e-cigarette intervention. And we also at that point uh, included purely observational longitudinal surveys with no intervention provided. And those would survey existing smokers, ask about their e-cigarette use and then follow them up later on. And we're interested in including studies which look at smoking cessation at six months or longer from baseline and a measure of harm at one week or longer. Now, when we first started this review, there was very little evidence out there. And it, it's unusual actually for Cochrane reviews of interventions um, to include anything other than randomized controlled trials. So as time has gone on and more and more studies have become available, we have decided um, prospectively, we announced our intention in 2016 not to include those purely observational studies anymore. So those are out now, but we're looking at evidence from randomized controlled trials and also uncontrolled intervention studies. In our latest update, we found 61 studies which met these criteria. 34 of them were randomized controlled trials and that equated to just under 17,000 participants providing data. The review includes lots of different comparisons and every time we update, there are more studies that give us more comparisons. But for the focus of this talk, I'm gonna talk about our three main comparisons. All of those involve nicotine e-cigarettes as the intervention. And we're interested in those compared to nicotine replacement therapy compared to behavioral support only or no support, and compared to non-nicotine e-cigarettes, which also sometimes can be referred to as placebo e-cigarettes. But given there are so many behavioral, psychological, and social elements about e-cigarettes that might actually really help people quit smoking as well, we change from that placebo terminology and just call them non-nicotine e-cigarettes. In terms of our outcomes, our primary outcomes are cessation. So that's our effectiveness outcome which we're interested in at six months or longer, longer, we use an intention to treat analysis here and anyone who's lost a follow-up is considered a continuing smoker, which is the most conservative way to treat this data. We're always interested in the strictest definition of abstinence. So for example, continuous over point prevalence, biochemically verified over self-reported. We're also interested in adverse events at one week or, or longer after e-cigarette use, and that's defined by study authors, and those are non-serious events, and serious adverse events, again, at one week or longer, um, using kind of standard terminology around those. I will cover those three outcomes in this presentation, but we also look at some other outcomes that you could look at the full review for, and that includes changes in relevant biomarkers. So again, here after a week or longer of e-cigarette use, we're interested in data on known carcinogens and toxicants, exhaled carbon monoxide, and measures such as airway and lung function and blood oxygen levels. One of the exciting things about doing this as a living systematic review, it's the first living systematic review we've done in our team, is that not only, of course, can we keep the review up to date, but we can also be a li little bit more responsive. So when we published our update last October, uh, a few different policymakers from different organizations and countries got in touch and asked if we collected data on how many people were still using e-cigarettes at the end of the studies. And we hadn't collected data on that. We thought, well, that would be a great thing to collect. Clearly there's interest in it. And so in our April update, we pre-specified that we are gonna be including this as an outcome moving forward. And this September update is the first time that we include this new outcome. So we're also interested in product use at six months or longer. And we define that as the proportion of participants using the assigned study product. So e-cigarettes with or without nicotine or medication at the longest follow-up. So moving on to our findings. First up, when we compared nicotine e-cigarettes to nicotine replacement therapy and looked at quitting at six months or longer, we found moderate certainty evidence that more people were quitting in the arms receiving nicotine e-cigarettes compared to nicotine replacement therapy. We didn't find any huge variation between the studies, certainly none that would cause us concern. And here, certainty in the evidence is moderate. So what that means, just 
for people who aren't familiar with grade ratings is grade is a process that Copeland uses and also other organizations use to think about our certainty in an overall body of evidence for given outcomes and comparisons. And the highest grade rating you can have is high certainty of evidence. What that means, if we're saying that something's high certainty, that means that even if new studies come along, we don't think they're likely to change our results in any meaningful way. And for example, our review of nicotine replacement therapy versus placebo has high certainty evidence. We have over a hundred studies there, more come out, they all tend to find the same thing. Our certainty remains high that NRT helps people quit. Here, our certainty is moderate. And the issue that we have here is imprecision. So basically what that means is, according to grade standards, we don't have enough studies, or the studies we have aren't big enough or don't have sufficient outcomes occurring for us to be totally certain in our findings. So this is something that could easily change as updates continue. If we find more studies, if they're fairly large and they find results consistent with what we found so far, then we would expect that grade rating to increase to high. Conversely, if we found a study that showed the polar opposite of these studies and we didn't know why, that might, di might diminish our grade rating. So looking at adverse events at one week or longer, we also found moderate certainty evidence here. And in this case of no difference in occurrence of adverse events. So these are non-serious ones between nicotine e-cigarettes and nicotine replacement therapy. When we looked at serious adverse events, here our certainty of the evidence is low. So that means we think our findings definitely could change. And the issue here is very serious imprecision. So one of the great things about these trials so far has been that for the most part, there have been very few serious adverse events in either the e-cigarette arms or the other non-e-cigarette arms. So that's wonderful for the participants, but for the simple purpose of our data analysis puts us in a position where if we have a very small number of events in some studies, no events occurred at all, then that really limits our ability to say anything about if one intervention could be causing any change in the number of serious adverse events that are occurring. So when we looked at nicotine e-cigarettes versus non-nicotine e-cigarettes or placebo e-cigarettes, here again, we found consistent evidence showing a higher quit rate in people using nicotine e-cigarettes compared to non-nicotine e-cigarettes. And here again, our certainty in the evidence is moderate with that limitation being that imprecision. So not enough studies of those we have, not enough data within those studies. And so we need more studies in order to get a more precise, uh, higher certainty estimate. Low certainty evidence of no difference in adverse events, and here this is just because of very few studies reporting data in a way that could be used in our analyses, and low certainty evidence uh, of no difference in serious adverse events at a week or longer. Here again, very few studies reporting data of those that did. Um, thankfully, in many of them, no serious adverse events occurred, but it makes it very hard to find any patterns in the data. When we compare nicotine e-cigarettes versus behavioral support only or no support, the first thing I'd like to do is just explain what we mean by this. Some people think that what we're trying to describe here are head-to-head -head comparisons. So let's say one arm receives nicotine e-cigarettes and no other behavioral support, and the other receives counseling, and we're directly comparing the two. That's not what is in this analysis. What we're talking about in this analysis is everyone in intervention and control arms being completely matched in terms of the behavioral support they receive, whether that's no support or counseling, et cetera. Um, and then one arm also being randomized to receive nicotine containing e-cigarettes. And here again, we found evidence that more people were quitting at six months or longer in the arms randomized to nicotine e-cigarettes, but here are certainty and the evidence is very low. And that's, that's for two reasons. One is this issue of imprecision. Once again, not that many studies, not that much data. But the other issue here is that due to the nature of these studies and the nature of this comparison, by Cochrane standards, these will always be considered studies at high risk of bias. And that's because one arm is receiving more support than the other arm and is aware of that. So they're enrolling in a nicotine e-cigarette study. One group is receiving nicotine e-cigarettes. One group isn't receiving any pharmacotherapy or any e-cigarettes. And that could be introducing bias as well. Although I think it's fair to say that when we think about our previous comparisons, so we're when we're comparing nicotine containing e-cigarettes and then the nicotine replacement therapy, and that way we're kind of isolating the e-cigarette delivery aspects. When we're comparing nicotine e-cigarettes to non-nicotine e-cigarettes, isolating the nicotine. So if we combine both of those together and compare them to no e-cigarettes and no nicotine, we would expect to see that more people were quitting using nicotine e-cigarettes. And indeed that is what we're seeing here. So very low certainty evidence here for the same reasons as with the first analysis. 
uh, when it comes to adverse events. We did see more people experiencing adverse events in nicotine e-cigarette arms compared to behavioral support only or no support arms, but again, very low certainty due to the nature of these studies. Uh, and with serious adverse events, we didn't find any clear evidence of a difference between arms, but again, very low certainty evidence there. Sorry, I think I've just skipped through slides and I don't know why. There we go. Um, sorry about that. And so next up, just our new outcome, quickly to report on this. We're interested here only in studies which are reporting data at six months or longer and are comparing nicotine e-cigarettes to non-nicotine e-cigarettes or to another pharmacotherapy. So we don't have a ton of data here. But what we did find, we had two studies that compared nicotine e-cigarettes to nicotine replacement therapy and looked at how many people were still using these products over time. One of them was by Russell and colleagues, and it was two different types of e-cigarettes, which is why it's showing up as split there. And the other was a large randomized control trial by Hayek et al. And they found markedly different results. So in Hayek, notably more people were still using e-cigarettes at the end of the study compared to those using nicotine replacement therapy at the end of the study. And that was a concern about this study broadly. And I think one of the things that, that prompted people to ask for this outcome to be included, but that wasn't found in Russell. So here we don't present bold results because quite frankly, it would be misleading. The, the findings are so different um, and we need more data to try and figure out what's going on. Is there something different in these populations? Is there something different about the e-cigarettes? Why are we seeing such different results? When we compared nicotine e-cigarettes to non-nicotine e-cigarettes, uh, there was no clear evidence of a difference in the number of people still using them at the end of the study. Uh, slightly more people appeared to be using nicotine e-cigarettes, but confidence intervals include the possibility of no difference there. In this latest update, we also have some new comparisons. So for the first time, we had studies comparing nicotine salt versus free base nicotine. That was only one study. Um, and at the time that we included it, it was only available as a conference abstract. We remain hopeful that one day we'll get our hands on a full manuscript, but it didn't report any difference in smoking cessation or product use, but at quite wide confidence intervals. And we also now have two studies which are randomizing people who are already dual users of combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes at baseline, and then they're randomized to standard advice or to advise on how to quit smoking using their e-cigarette. So we had two studies there, only one of them reported a cessation outcome that was eligible for our review. And it didn't find a statistically significant difference, but it did find that more people were quitting um, in that tailored advice arm with wide confidence intervals. So our hope and expectation would be that we'll be adding some more studies to that analysis over time as well, because as we know, there are a lot of people who are dual users who are using both nicotine e-cigarettes and smoking combustible cigarettes. And it would be interesting to see if giving some advice about how to use their e-cigarettes to help them give up combustible and then hopefully eventually give up e-cigarettes as well could help these people transition out of tobacco use. So all Cochrane reviews and with implications for practice and implications for research, I won't go through all of these, but I'll cover what I think are our key points. The evidence that suggests that nicotine e-cigarettes can help people quit smoking was really consistent across several comparisons. And that was quite reassuring to see. We had moderate certainty evidence, and there our issue was imprecision, so not enough studies, not enough events, that e-cigarettes and nicotine increase quit rates at six months or longer, and that's compared to non-nicotine e-cigarettes and compared to nicotine replacement therapy. We have less certain evidence that e-cigarettes with nicotine increase quit rates compared to no e-cigarettes. Um, and no pharmacotherapy. But as I mentioned, that is a challenging area because that comparison will always be limited by the fact that that study design means that we consider them at high risk of bias. And I'd say those other two comparisons are probably more meaningful. And in general, what we want to see more of in this area are direct comparisons between e-cigarettes and other stop smoking interventions, which are known to be effective because at this point, um, it's very unusual that you'd be randomizing someone to receive no support at all to quit smoking if they're interested in enrolling in a stopping smoking trial. So the most informative trials really are going to be those that are comparing nicotine e-cigarettes against other frontline stop smoking support. We had uh, one study looking at the effect of uh, nicotine e-cigarettes when added to nicotine replacement therapy. So both arms receiving the same nicotine replacement therapy, one arm also receiving nicotine e-cigarettes. That study didn't have any definitive results, and so it's unclear what the effect of that might be. 
None of our included studies detected serious adverse events considered possibly related to e-cigarette use, but there are a lot of important caveats around that statement. First of all, these were in the short to midterm. They were only up to two years. That was our longest follow-up. As I showed you, very few studies actually reported these events. Very few events occurred. So we have low certainty evidence for that reason. But of course, the other thing to note is that what these trials are testing for the most part are regulated nicotine containing products that have made themselves into a trial. Um, and so what we're not saying here are categorical statement about the safety of any type of e-cigarette ever. What we're saying is the, the, trial, the products that are being tested here aren't flagging major safety concerns in these trials. And in terms of adverse events, when we looked at the types of adverse events, the most commonly reported ones were things like throat and mouth irritation, headache, cough, and nausea. Those tended to dissipate over time and are not dissimilar from what we see in trials of oral nicotine replacement therapies. In some of the studies we looked at, when we looked at those biomarker outcomes, the biomarkers were observed in people who switched from smoking to vaping that were pretty consistent with people who, other studies in which people stop smoking and don't don't vape afterwards. Um, but for the most part, those were quite underpowered because not that many studies reported on those outcomes. And so we're looking forward to more data on those as well. In terms of implications for research, one of the great things about working on this review is that every time we update it, we call for more research in certain areas. And then when we search for that research, we can see that those studies have been published or that they've been registered and list them as an ongoing study and see that they're on their way. So this remains a really active research field in terms of the types of studies that we'll be including in this review moving forward. We, of course, want to see more trials of e-cigarettes for smoking cessation, which are measuring cessation at six months or longer. As I mentioned earlier, we're really interested in studies which are using active comparators. So studies which are comparing to nicotine replacement therapy, which we have a good number of now, but also it would be great to see more that are comparing to varenicline. At the moment, we only have one small study uh, which looks at that, and that was available only as a conference abstract, I believe. So we'd like more studies really comparing to frontline pharmacotherapies. And when it comes to nicotine replacement therapy, of those studies which used it as a comparator, some were using dual forms, so short and long acting, but some were only using one form of NRT. So ideally what you'd wanna do is be comparing nicotine e-cigarettes to uh, both short and long acting NRT used simultaneously, which we know gives the best chances of successfully quitting. We'd really like these studies to assess the safety profile for as long as possible. And I know there are funding applications in at the moment and plans to kind of extend the follow-up of some of these studies, which would be very useful and also be powered to detect differences in safety outcomes. It's difficult to predict what's gonna happen with this evidence, but I think the direction we're moving in is fairly clear so far. Certainly all the signals we're getting are showing that nicotine cigarettes can help people quit smoking. And if we have more studies and they find that we might move to a place of having high certainty evidence in that area. But the main thing that is going to stop people from wanting to recommend these products are safety concerns. And the studies are not powered to look at serious adverse events in any way. I know it's hard to do. I know it's expensive to power a study on these rare outcomes, but it is really important that we start trying to do better in terms of this so that we can be able to say things with a bit more certainty here. Ideally, we want to see studies presenting safety in both absolute and relative risk terms. So this is specific to the area we're looking at. We are not comparing e-cigarettes to never smoking and never vaping here. We're looking at the use of e-cigarettes in people who are already smoking and they're being used as a tool to help them quit. So of course, we're interested in the harms of e-cigarettes relative to nothing, but we're also really interested in the harms of e-cigarettes relative to the harms of combustible tobacco. And those are really important nuances when it comes to communicating our results, particularly to people who smoke who may be thinking about switching. One of the challenges of research in this area is that, especially when we first started, we we're in the situation where it took a long time for the studies to get funded. It takes a long time for studies to run and then get written up. And by the time the studies made it into our review, the devices that they were testing were no longer in any way representative of what was on the market. We're working in an area where technology is evolving. So the first two randomized controlled trials, by the time they made it into our review, those devices had been withdrawn because they were just shown to be very poor at delivering nicotine. Devices have gotten a lot better at that. And if you're someone who smokes, who's thinking about switching and wants to know what the evidence shows, you really wanna see that evidence that's as relevant as possible to what the product you might actually be using in the current moment of time might be. But we're really excited in this, in this update to have 
our first trial of a pod device reporting on cessation um, because those studies are still particularly lacking. As with any area, great if protocols and statistical analysis blends are registered in advance and openly available. And it would be good to see e-cigarettes provided in a way that would be used in real world settings where possible or integrated into existing stop smoking treatments. So that is it for me. Um, the Cochrane review itself is enormous. And so there's lots I haven't been able to cover. And I very much encourage you to see the full review for more detail on everything I've presented, as well as secondary outcomes, other comparisons, our data from our uncontrolled intervention studies and comparisons with other reviews in this area. And please, if you're interested in it, keep taking a look if you wanna see the new use of red evidence because we'll be publishing it every month. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Jamie. That was so interesting. Um, and we are right on time and we are going to transition to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Siegel. I just want to rem remind the audience, you can put your questions in the chat. We will get to them after Dr. Siegel's talk. Um, and we have reserved, I think, about a half an hour, maybe a little bit less for, for Q&A. So um, you'll have your opportunity then. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce um, Dr. Siegel. Uh, Dr. Michael Siegel is a visiting professor in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at, at the Tufts University School of Medicine. And prior to that was a professor of community health sciences at the BU School of Public Health for almost three decades. His work in tobacco control is focused on the effect, health effects of secondhand smoke, cigarette advertising and marketing practices, and the impact of other tobacco control policies on youth and adult smoking behavior. His current research focuses on electronic cigarettes and policy regarding these products. And the title of his presentation is Impacts of State Level Tobacco Flavor Bans. Um, so to you, uh, Dr. Siegel. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. Tidy. Um, I appreciate that introduction. And I especially wanna thank the center um, and Dr. Higgins in particular for this kind invitation um, to speak today. And it's, a, it's really an honor to be here and, and particularly to be a part of this particular um, panel um, with colleagues from many of the organizations through which, um, with which I've worked during my career. Um, so it's, a, it's really special for me. Um, so despite the, the um, very promising information that you just heard, um, from Dr. Hartman Boyce about the, um, the benefits or uh, potential benefits of electronic cigarettes for adult smokers. What I wanna make clear to begin right off, the, right off the offset is that current government policy is decidedly uh, not favorable for electronic cigarettes. Um, and this is one, one area where there is a tremendous uniformity of policy. You know, there's a lot of areas in tobacco which are gray. This is an area where all, pretty much all government uh, agencies are on the same page, whether it be the federal government, the state government, or, or local government. So in terms of federal policy, the FDA officially bans flavored electronic cigarettes. And there's only two exceptions. One is uh, menthol. They don't ban menthol e-cigarettes. Um, and the second is for um, open systems. So if, it's, if you have a closed system, meaning a cartridge or pod-based system, you are not allowed to, um, to market flavored electronic cigarettes officially. Um, so federal policy is obviously you know, decidedly against the idea of having uh, e-cigarettes as part of the uh, strategy for smoking cessation. Um, five states ban, completely ban the sale of flavored e-cigarettes. And over 200 municipalities uh, also ban the, the sale of flavored e-cigarettes. Uh, so there's a definite negative uh, uh, bias against e-cigarettes that's manifest in, in policy across the board in the United States. I think it's really interesting to point out that of the studies that Dr. Hartman, Hartman Boyce um, presented that compared e-cigarettes and nicotine replacement therapy uh, in clinical trials, none of those occurred in the United States. And that, that was really striking to me um, because 
you know, normally it's the opposite. Normally we see a lot of studies in the US and, and then some international studies, but here it's kind of interesting that, that, that the studies that are being done to evaluate e-cigarettes um, in terms of the potential benefits are all being done outside of the United States, particularly in the UK, New Zealand and Canada, um, but not in the US. And, and the only studies that are really done in the US to evaluate cigarette, e-cigarettes are looking at the potential harms of these products. And I think that's, it's just kind of a, an interesting observation. And um, perhaps in the, later in the Q&A, we can talk about the, what that means and why that might be. Um, but I think it's an important observation. So what is the conceptual rationale for these flavored e-cigarette bans? Why is this the pretty much the national uniform policy in the United States? Well, this is the, the conceptual rationale that has led policymakers and tobacco agent, uh, anti-tobacco agencies to support this agenda. And so the, the, the rationale goes like this. Um, flavored e-cigarettes have tremendous youth appeal. And that youth appeal leads to youth vaping and youth take up electronic cigarettes in large numbers. The widespread presence of youth vaping where youth are doing an activity that looks like smoking is renormalizing youth cigarette use. So while youth cigarette use we know has been declining for a long time, the, the conceptual rationale is that youth vaping is, is reversing that process. It's reversing that culture by renormalizing the use of something that looks like a cigarette. And that eventually that renormalization is gonna actually increase youth smoking. And if you look at the uh, some of the headlines in, in newspapers, you'll see that this indeed is the information that is coming out to the public. Um, so here's a study that was being promoted by saying that using certain e-cigarette devices can lead to smoking more cigarettes. Um, so teens who, who vape actually end up smoking more. Um, here's a study uh, or an article about a study saying, are e-cigs a gateway to smoking? Noting that most young people who use them also use other forms of tobacco, um, which suggests uh, that, that maybe e-cigarettes are a gateway to smoking. Um, and then here's an article, The Gateway Effect of E-Cigarettes, Reflections uh, on Main Criticism. So this is an article that uh, not only presents the gateway hypothesis, but actually refutes any argument that has made, been made against that. Uh, and again, concluding that, that e-cigarettes are a gateway to youth smoking. And so that's the rationale that you see. Um, and that's the rationale that's actually listed if you go to any of the ordinances or laws that have been passed that ban flavored e-cigarettes. So this is San Francisco. Um, San Francisco has one of the most comprehensive bans on flavored uh, tobacco products, um, which is basically you can't sell them. Um, there's no exemptions. There's no, uh, there's no, you know, types of stores where you're, you can, if you're 20, you know, only allowed 21 year olds or something, you can sell them. It's just, you cannot sell flavored e-cigarettes in the city of San Francisco. And so here's their rationale. And you'll see that it follows directly this conceptual hypothesis that I, that I outlined. Um, so they say each day about 2,500 children in the US try their first cigarette and another 400 children under 18 years of age become new regular daily smokers. 81% of youth who have ever used a tobacco product report that the first tobacco product they used was flavored. So you can see here, this is the gateway hypothesis that's leading to this law. They're afraid that kids are using flavored vapes and that they're then gonna go on to use real cigarettes. Um, flavored tobacco products promote youth initiation of tobacco use and help young occasional smokers to become daily smokers by reducing or masking the harshness and taste of tobacco smoke and thereby increasing the appeal of tobacco products. As tobacco companies well know, menthol in particular cools and numbs the throat to reduce throat irritation and make the smoke feel smoother, making menthol cigarettes an appealing option for youth who are initiating tobacco use. 
Tobacco companies have used flavorings such as mint and wintergreen in smokeless tobacco products as part of a graduation strategy, gateway, think gateway, to encourage new users to start with tobacco products with lower levels of nicotine and progress to products with higher levels of nicotine. So clearly what is, what is going on here, the rationale for San Francisco's ban on flavored electronic cigarettes is not so much that electronic cigarettes are going to directly harm youth, but that they are going to serve as a gateway to tobacco use, that they're going to denormalize this culture of non-smoking that we've worked so hard to create, um, undermine that progress, and, and create a culture, recreate a culture of, of tobacco use. So today, what I want to talk about is what does the evidence show? What is the effect of flavored electronic cigarette bans? What do we know um, based on the actual scientific evidence? And I uh, don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose in particular. Um, I have not received any funding or compensation and have no financial interest in any uh, tobacco, e-cigarette or uh, pharmaceutical company. So I think the most important thing we can look at is directly look at the effect of San Francisco's ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products, because that's one of the most uh, striking and, and most uh, kind of far reaching laws that went into effect. And so I think it could be very informative to look at, okay, well, what happened when they passed their law? Um, and it turns out there was uh, one study that was done that looked at the impact of this, of this law it was uh, published by uh, Professor Friedman at Yale School of Public Health. And this was a difference in differences analysis of youth smoking um, in relation to the, to the sales ban. And what she did was took data from the 2011 through 2019 youth risk behavior surveys and uh, collected data for seven different cities, San Francisco, but also um, control cities, which were New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, San Diego, uh, Broward County, Florida, which includes Fort Lauderdale, Orange County, um, California, which is just outside of LA and includes all of the Los Angeles suburbs, and then Palm Beach County uh, in, in Florida as well. Um, this was a very highly powered study. There were 100,000 100, youth um, approximately 10,000 in San Francisco, and then about 10,000 in each of the other places. So, um, so this was a very, very, uh, it was clearly a po highly powered population-based study. And here's what she found. Uh, she found, based on the difference of differences analysis, that while uh, you can see the, the, the rates of smoking in San Francisco and all of the other cities were basically the same, kind of paralleling each other from 2011 all the way through 2018 after the uh, flavored e-cigarette ban went into effect in San Francisco, there was a sudden diversion in the smoking rates. Um, smoking rates in all the other districts that were studied continued to, to progress downwards. Whereas in San Francisco, there was an increased propensity for youth to start smoking. So not exactly what the conceptual hypothesis predicted. That in fact, this is really the opposite of what was predicted by the, by the conceptual hypothesis. In fact, there's at least some data here suggesting that the San Francisco ban on flavored uh, tobacco products actually led to a, a, an increase in the number of youth who were smoking real tobacco cigarettes. Um, and she, she concluded that um, basically the, the analysis found that San Francisco's flavor ban was associated with more than double odds of recent smoking among uh, underage high school students relative to current, current changes in other districts. The odds ratio, adjusted odds ratio was about 2.24, which is a pretty big effect that youth were twice as likely to be smokers uh, compared to youth in the other districts. Um, and she concludes that the ban on flavored tobacco product sales was associated with increased smoking among minor high school students relative to other school districts. 
uh, that while, while the policy applied to all tobacco products, its outcome was likely greater for youth who vaped uh, than those who smoked due to higher rates of flavored tobacco use among those who vape. This raises concerns that reducing access to flavored electronic nicotine delivery systems may motivate youth who would otherwise vape to substitute smoking. And indeed, analyses of how minimum legal sales ages for uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems are associated with youth smoking also suggest such substitution. So what she's pointing to here is, is a body of other studies, which I wanna briefly go through. Um, so these are not studies that looked at the effect of tobacco bans but they looked at the effect of other ways of restricting access to electronic cigarettes. Um, so this study published by this group of economists uh, from Georgia State uh, looked at the effect of minimum legal sale age laws on youth substance use. So they looked at, um, and this is specifically for electronic cigarettes. So they looked at states that did or did not increase the legal age of sale um, for electronic cigarettes, and they found about a one per percentage point difference with states that had higher uh, legal age of sale for electronic cigarettes actually experiencing slightly higher smoking, youth smoking rates than would be expected or that than were ex experienced in the states that didn't have those laws. Another way of reducing youth access to electronic cigarettes is through taxes. We know that when you increase any kind of taxes, but in particular cigarette taxes or e-cigarette taxes, youth use of those products declined. And what they found was that, uh, whoops, they found, uh, well, actually, I won't, the abstract is a little bit technical, but here's what they say in kind of plain language. Um, our results suggest that e-cigarettes are elastic goods and their use substantially reduces cigarette sales. And what they mean here is that e-cigarettes and cigarettes are basically basically serve as substitute products. As e-cigarette sales go up, cigarette sales go down and vice versa. Um, so if you have an intervention that reduces access or makes it difficult, more difficult to obtain one of these products, then the use of the other product will increase. And in fact, uh, there was another study done by um, this group of economists that looked specifically at this issue and basically concluded that um, higher e-cigarette tax rates actually increase traditional cigarette use and reduce e-cigarette use. And another way of state stating that is that these are uh, substitute products. Um, cross-tax effects imply that the products are economic substitutes. So the technical fancy word they're using for this is economic substitutes. But it, what it really means is that, um, you know, in a sense, the, the total amount of use of vaping and cigarettes is going to stay constant. It's just a question of which product people are going to use. And depending on how you differentially regulate cigarettes with respect to e-cigarettes, that's going to kind of dictate which product is predominating in the market. There was a second study that looked directly at the effects of um, e-cigarette uh, laws, e-cigarette bans on youth smoking, um, also by Abby, Abby Friedman uh, at Yale. And she found, again, a small increase in youth smoking in uh, localities where there was a a ban on, and this was at the state level. So states that had a ban on the sale of flavored electronic cigarettes, um, she found that youth smoking rates were slightly higher than in states without such a ban. There's a second line of research, which I think is, is important to look at. And that is um, research that looks at the effect of this drastic increase in youth e-cigarette use on youth smoking over time. So at this point, in, in 2021, we've had a increase in e-cigarette use, uh, a so-called epidemic of youth e-cigarette use that's been going on since 2011. We've been talking about it now for almost a full decade. And so if it were true that this was a, that this, that e-cigarettes were denormalizing cigarette use and were going to lead to this huge increase in youth smoking, we would certainly be seeing the effects of that by now in youth smoking rates. And so this study by 
um, uh, Sokol and, and Feldman um, looked at uh, high school seniors who used, it basically it was called high school seniors who used e-cigarettes may have otherwise been cigarette smokers, evidence for monitoring the future. So they looked at the 2009 to 2018 monitoring the future studies um, of, of high school seniors. And they forecast future smoking prevalence using propensity score modeling uh, based on individual youth's uh, demogra socio-demographic characteristics. And they compared that to the actual smoking prevalence that occurred. And this is what they found. So the, the dotted black line here is actual, the actual cigarette smoking prevalence over time. And you can see that no matter how they projected it for whatever years they were looking at, the actual decline in youth smoking was markedly greater than what would have been expected uh, based on not having the introduction of electronic cigarettes. So prior to 2011, um, there really wasn't much vaping going on. Um, after 2011, when we see this dramatic rise in, in e-cigarettes, what we're actually observing on a population level is pretty much an equally dramatic decline in youth smoking prevalence and certainly a much greater decline than would have been expected in the absence of, of e-cigarettes. Um, they conclude that this study provides further evidence in support of early, earlier findings that although youth e-cigarette use has increased rapidly, the decline in current smoking among 12th graders has accelerated since the availability of e-cigarettes. Our findings uh, also support work showing that adolescents who tried e-cigarettes as, the as their tobacco product were less likely to have ever smoked or currently smoked cigarettes compared with adolescents who used another non-cigarette tobacco product first. Um, among non-smoking youth, vaping is largely concentrated among those who would have likely smoked prior to the introduction of e-cigarettes. And the introduction of e-cigarettes has coincided with an acceleration in the decline of youth smoking rates. E-cigarettes may be an important tool for population-based harm reduction, even considering their impact on youth. What about effects on, on adult smokers? So most of the studies that I've talked about are looking at um, specifically what are the effect of flavored e-cigarette bans on, um, on youth smokers or on youth. And I do wanna point out that studies that have looked at, um, in this case, uh, e-cigarette taxes, uh, state e-cigarette tax in Minnesota on adult smoking basically found that as you increase the, the tax on electronic cigarettes, uh, adult smoking also increases. Um, so the estimates here suggest that the e-cigarette tax increased adult smoking and reduced smoking cessation in Minnesota relative to the control group. Uh, it implies a cross elasticity of about 0.13. What does that translate into? Uh, our results suggested in the sample period about 32,000 additional adult smokers would have quit smoking in Minnesota in the absence of the tax. And then they basically say, if this tax were imposed on a national level, about 1.8 million smokers would be deterred from quitting, which is a, quite a drastic uh, impact. I think another important thing to look at is what the tobacco analysts say. I always, I always am interested in what tobacco analysts are saying because although um, as academicians, um, we are, you know, we have the luxury of, I like to say we have the luxury of guessing or to put it in, in statistical terms, providing estimates, um, the tobacco analysts really have to get this right uh, because they have billions of dollars of financial investments that are resting on their predictions. And so um, I, te I tend to find tobacco analysts provide really sound and, and really evidence-based predictions and they're not biased. There's no bias because they're, they need to get it right. Um, that's how they make their money is by getting it right. So. Um, tobacco analysts have estimated that if the FDA doesn't approve any of the e-cigarette applications that they're currently re reviewing, then about 11% of U.S. nicotine volumes are going to shift into other categories, likely cigarettes. And so think about the burden 
of tobacco related disease that that's going to that that's going to cause an 11% shift from nicotine in the form of e-cigarettes into the form of actual real tobacco cigarettes so what i want to close with is to suggest that perhaps there's a different conceptual model that's actually going on here and and that is it starts out the same way. The story starts out the same way that flavored e-cigarettes have youth appeal and that youth appeal is leading to this tremendous popularity of youth vaping. But here, this green circle is where things change. Instead of this youth vaping, renormalizing cigarette smoking, this culture of vaping is largely replacing a culture of smoking. And when I go into the high schools, when I go into the middle schools, this is what I see with my eyes, you know, putting, setting aside all these, these fancy statistical studies, um, you know, the, the, the plain eye test, as I call it, if you go into a high school, if you talk to the kids, what you're gonna find out in, in pretty much any high school in America, is that they're gonna tell you that this culture of vaping has replaced the culture of smoking. It hasn't made smoking cooler. It hasn't enticed kids to smoke, it's enticed kids to vape. What's cool among high school kids is vaping and juuling, not smoking. In fact, it's made smoking even less cool uh, because now kids have an alternative that is even cooler. Um, and so I think that the, the more likely conceptual model is that youth vaping has created a culture of vaping that has largely replaced the culture of smoking and has therefore contributed to a decrease in youth smoking. Now, before I close, um, I don't want people to go too far with this and say, oh, well, you know, Dr. Siegel is saying that the more we provoke promote youth vaping, the more we can decrease youth smoking. So he's actually saying, you know, let's actually go out and encourage kids to vape. Um, and that's far from what I'm saying. Um, absolutely, I don't think that, that that's the case at all. I think what the purpose of this analysis is, is simply to show that we can achieve two goals at the same time. On the one hand, we can promote e-cigarette cessation, or we can promote smoking cessation for adult smokers using e-cigarettes. Um, in order to have tremendous health benefits for adult smokers. But we can do that without the competing risk of having a new generation of youth smokers uh, and youth who are addicted to, to smoking and are gonna be chain smokers for their lives and end up with you know, 40 years from now seeing increased emphysema and COPD and, and, uh, and cancer death rates and, and say, oh, wow, wish what a mistake we made 40 years ago when we when we didn't get rid of e-cigarettes. And I think that the evidence is showing that that's not gonna happen. What is gonna happen is that we're gonna have a culture of youth vaping and we need to deal with that. We need to have interventions to try to reduce youth vaping. Um, but banning the products is not the way to do that uh, because it's gonna have not only deleterious effects on adult smokers, but it's going to have deleterious effects on youth themselves, and it's going to actually increase the amount of smoking that we see in the youth population. So thank you so much for, for, your, um, for the opportunity to, to participate, and, and I look forward to the questions and the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we have had a bunch of questions, a um, few hot topics in the Q&A. Uh, I guess I would invite our panelists to jump back on. Um, so I'm gonna start by asking some questions that came from the audience. And uh, yeah, and I just wanna thank all of you speakers for great presentations. Um, so uh, dual use is a hot topic. Um, it came up, uh, um, it came up in Dr. Graham's presentation and Dr. Sheffer's presentation. So maybe, um, Dr. Graham, how do you, um, do you assess effects of e-cig cessation on 
cigarette use. And the question for Dr. Sheffer was, what advice do quit lines give about e-cig use to people who are trying to quit smoking? Um, and then just a general uh, note was that the, the Hayek et al. Uh, RCT noted that uh, while 18% of the e-cig users um, attained abstinence, there was, I think, 25% who were, who um, be, were, I guess they were dual users of e-cigs and conventional cigarettes at the end of the trial. So um, how much of a concern is that in, and that's, I guess, for all, open to all of you. Um, I'll kick it off. I did see this question come in during my uh, presentation. We did measure dual use. Um, you saw in the sample characteristics that uh, about a third of the sample reported past 30 day um, cigarette use at enrollment. We did not exclude dual users uh, specifically because we wanted to look at the impact of e-cigarette cessation on um, smokers as they move through the trial. Um, I would love to say that we have had ample time to have completed those analyses. Uh, we've not yet, they're underway. Um, we've looked at uh, all our combustible users, so cigarettes, little cigars, um, and regular cigars, and the patterns, the sort of the trajectories of abstinence at our one month and seven month follow up. Uh, and we've also run a similar set of analyses looking at those who used marijuana at baseline. Um, there's some very early signals of what I have called kind of a quitting everything hypothesis that we're seeing among um, combusted users um, uh, and among cigarette users that we're not seeing among those who were dual users of marijuana. Um, but again, these are things that we peaked at right after the conclusion of the trial. They're underway um, and uh, hoping to have time uh, to dive into those more uh, throughout the remainder of the year. I will say, um, you know, much to echo what uh, Dr. Sheffer was saying, we are sitting on a mountain of data. And uh, if anybody's interested in collaborating, we would welcome the assistance to help us um, move through uh, that trove of data. So please do reach out. So um, I guess I'll address the, the questions about what, what quit lines do in, in general. I can talk about what we do and kind of um, what the, uh, gen I, I can't talk about what every specific quit line does because it is um, often dependent on the policy that the funder um, uh, wants for, for, for that quit line. And a lot of the quit lines we're scrambling to um, develop programs uh, to help people quit ends or, or e-cigarettes. Uh, a few years ago, um, you know, do we provide NRT? How do we provide NRT? How do we understand dosing? What? How do we adapt what we are already? And most quit lines, I think, are are doing that at this time. Um, the in terms of advice, um, the the quit lines are kind of. Um, conservative in that uh, they'll stick with the evidence base, right? So if, if, if right now it's not an evidence-based product and um, our goal I think is to educate uh, callers uh, as best we can, keeping up as best we can about the, um, the, the harms of, of e-cig use as a, in addition to the, um, the uh, you know, use for, for quitting. That being said, uh, a pretty good proportion, I don't have the data with me right now, but the uh, of callers who um, took quit lines have used e-cigs, right? Um, many of them uh, used them and then didn't use them anymore. Um, it, there, it's different topography using, you know, not everybody's attracted to the the, the, the e-cig use. So many have, have used that and we, um, if they want to quit e cigs then we work with them to quit e cigs But if they don't want to quit e cigs then we tend to just leave it alone, you know, um, and work with what they want to do. You know, um, how can we make this um, uh, e cig use work for them? Because there's adaptive forms of using e cigs and then there's not adaptive forms of, of use, using e cigs and kind of distinguishing um, between the two. Um, so I, I think that might, um, address that question. 
Uh, but let me know if I, and, and again, uh, there's so much work to be done in this area. Can I just, um, just add in terms of, <clears throat> I think dual use is a really, it's a great question. It's a really important thing to consider. And what I wanna add is simply that it's among the dual users that I think policy has the greatest effect. Um, because, you know, people who are, who have completely quit, switched to e-cigarettes are really, uh, many of them are very, very, um, you know, committed vapors. And so you raise the cigarette, the e-cigarette tax, they're still going to vape. Um, you ban flavored e-cigarettes, they're still going to go uh, either get them off the black market or they're just going to mix it themselves. Um, it's the dual users who I think are the group that is the most impressionable, most malleable, based on the, the, the external conditions. So it, those are the exact people who, if you raise the e-cigarette tax, they're gonna be smoking more. Um, or if you ban flavored e-cigarettes, they're gonna say, okay, this is just too much of a pain. I'm gonna really, it's just, I'm gonna get my cigarettes normally and maybe occasionally have an e-cigarette. So I think the dual users are actually the most malleable, malleable group that's gonna be most susceptible to, to the, these types of policies. And we have to think about that in, um, in how we deal with that phenomena. If, if I might um, comment on that a little bit, um, the, you know, we're, Mashe, Ganowitz and folks have, have shown that the dual use is just as harmful as cigarette smoking on its own. And so I think that needs to be considered in that, um, you know, I, I don't know that this, that this is a binary choices here, um, but, uh, you know, dual use is not good, right? Not good, not good at all. Even if you're, you're using um, fewer cigarettes than um, before, you know? If I could just jump in on that as well. Um, I think with dual use, I think one of the questions is kind of hinting at, is it a concern if we're giving people who smoke e-cigarettes and they haven't used e-cigarettes before, are we then creating dual users? And are we concerned about that? And I think we still need more data on it, but the evidence I have seen so far, and certainly the evidence in our conference review from the studies that have looked at it, have shown that either with dual use, you see some reductions in some biomarkers, how meaningful both are in the air. Um, but we ha what I haven't seen in, in our intervention studies that we looked at is evidence that dual use is more harmful than just smoking without also using e-cigarettes. So I think that's key to consider. But I also think one of the critical questions is what happens when people start dual using? We need longitudinal data in terms of trajectories. Are they then more likely to end up successfully quitting? Is this a, a step on a pathway? Uh, or is it something that's enabling ongoing smoking, et cetera? And it's a real issue if we look at observational data here, because often the reasons that people are starting to use e-cigarettes and unable to transition off of smoking have to do with the level of addiction with various underlying health conditions that might be as play as well. So I think experimental designs and intervention studies are the best way to look at these questions about dual use. And we should be really encouraging more of those because I think we do need more information. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Hartman Boyce, while we have you, uh, questions have also come up in the chat about um, flavors as a moderator of effects. Um, is, are there plans to look at flavors as a moderator of e-cig effects? Is there any evidence that you know of that non-tobacco, non-menthol flavors are necessary to retain the, the, the benefit of e-cigs for cessation? Yeah, so we would love to look at that. And our original intention was that if we had studies that were, you know, if we had sufficient studies and analyses, we could kind of make indirect comparisons based on flavors in there. We don't have sufficient studies to do that at the moment. It would be it would be underpowered and, and not very useful. But actually what I really hope we see and what we'd certainly include if they came out and met our inclusion criteria are studies which are having head-to-head -head comparisons based on flavors. So at the moment, a lot of our studies are giving users a choice across different flavors, which is, is useful and nice to see. But I'd love to see some studies which were looking at effectiveness and directly comparing different flavor options of e-cigarettes where they were randomizing different groups to different flavors. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Siegel, there was a question for you in the chat about um, potentially 
you know, you, you focused a lot on the gateway hypothesis. You didn't really address the direct effects of nicotine on the developing brain and, you know, creating a nicotine addiction among youth. Is this, I know you're a physician, is this a concern for you as a physician based on the research that you're aware of? How concerned should we be about that? That, that is the concern. In fact, that is the number one and potentially really only concern. I mean, I, I think that is the problem. That is the problem. The problem with electronic cigarettes is nicotine addiction. If these products weren't addictive, um, then this would be uh, a much less weighty conversation. In other words, um, you know, kids who are using these products for a couple of years while it's a fad and then it's going to eventually go away, there's probably not going to be long-term effects on their health. If somebody becomes addicted to nicotine and use these products for a long term, that is a problem. And even if they don't, even if they are just addicted for a short time during high school, for example, it has an effect on their performance. If they're addicted and they're, you know, they're dependent, they're running to the bathroom every period to try to puff on their jewel, I mean, that's going to affect their academic performance and their, and their functioning. So, so that, in fact, is the, the focus. And I think that's where our focus should be. Rather than focusing our policy on getting rid of e-cigarettes as a category and getting rid of all flavors, um, which will have the negative impacts that I, that I talked about, um, we should be focusing on making sure that companies like Juul can't put 49 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine in their products and that they can't use a nicotine salt derivation of the nicotine, which is absorbed extremely rapidly into the bloodstream. And so that's the problem. The problem is that companies like Juul are number one, using nicotine salts, which enhance the absorption of nicotine. And number two, they're using astronomical levels of nicotine. And there's just no place for that. Um, in the UK, these products, Juul doesn't go above 19 milligrams per milliliter, and it works fine. Lots, the, the, the evidence I've seen from the UK is that smokers are doing great using e-cigarettes. Smoking cessation rates are very high. So you just don't need these extremely high levels. Um, and so I think that's what the FDA's focus is on. In reviewing the PMTAs, it should be looking at um, how addictive is your product to youth? And, and, and let's get these tobacco salts off the market, and let's get these extremely high nicotine products off the market. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question for me, actually, um, because I study I, um, people with mental health conditions who smoke and are many, most wanna quit. They struggle with quitting. Um, and no one wants to see youth using e-cigs, but I worry about um, some of the educational campaigns that we see are so dramatic and hard hitting um, that we're scaring off adults uh, who are smokers and might benefit, if they're unable to quit completely, might benefit from switching to e-cigs. So for those of you who have familiarity with educational campaigns and, and, and communications research, is there a way to thread that needle and talk about relative risks and the continuum of risks? Or is it just too complex? And are there too many potential unintended negative consequences of that? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, um, I think that's a really good point. And I think what we've seen working in this area is over time as we've become more and more certain based on the evidence that e-cigarettes, though not harmless, are significantly less harmful than traditional cigarettes. Public opinion has gone the absolute opposite direction. So it's getting worse and worse. Um, and that's terrible to see when you're someone who, who likes to look at the evidence. And I think, so you might be able to tell my, from my accent, I'm from the States originally, but I'm based in England. And it, it really always strikes me the profound difference in public health messaging that happens in the two countries. And here in England, we, we quite actively promote e-cigarettes as a stop smoking tool. And so for example, if I was in the hospital for an outpatient appointment and what I saw was a big poster uh, suggesting the use of e-cigarettes to help someone quit smoking and the person in that poster was like, a late 60s man, right? Like looked kind of like a grandfather. And that's the images that we're seeing of e-cigarettes. 
And I don't know if we have any formal studies of that, but I don't think that that image is encouraging young people to think that e-cigarettes are something they want to be involved in necessarily. And at the same time, what we have here is, is quite tight advertising controls and, and keeping on working on getting those tighter around things that might appeal to youth. So I think it, it is a false dichotomy to say, well, can we either promote these for adults to quit smoking or um, tell young people they're bad for them? I, I think we could probably do both. And I'll just no, go ahead. Go ahead I'll just After jump you. in. Obviously, um, our truth campaign has taken on the issue of vaping over the past couple of years. Uh, the beauty of social media platforms, the beauty of the the ability that we have to very specifically target with a laser focus the ages um, that we want to be seeing our message. Uh, we've been very effective in doing that almost. Uh, with the risk that adults in, you know, various uh, conferences and webinars that we've delivered have said, well, it, is there a youth prevention campaign running for vaping for young people? Um, because our messages are so targeted uh, that they're only reaching young people. And so I, I think there's a combination of leveraging technology, lever leveraging analytics to make sure we're reaching the right eyeballs um, with those messages. And and then, you know, threading that needle um, to be able to talk to an adult audience about the potential value of an e-cigarette, um, you know, as a harm reduction tool to, to get off cigarettes. I, I just want to, I guess, while I have the floor, just want to take the opportunity to, I, I guess, to build on something, Dr. Siegel, that, that you said, that, you know, there, there really is no role for thinking about nicotine use among young people. I think we can all collectively agree about that. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's not only about performance. It's not only about, um, you know, shame from parents, disappointing parents. We, you know, the, the fact that we're nearing 400,000 young people that have enrolled in a quit vaping program um, is staggering. And I think if you look through the literature, there is not any other example of this kind of uptake. We're starting to think about what is the total population of young people using e-cigarettes and is our program now approaching double digit percentages in terms of having reached them. These are kids who are self-initiating the process of reaching out for help and what we're seeing them saying back to us is that this is a miserable experience. It started as fun. It started as a way to manage stress. It started as something frivolous that they could do. Um, but the comments that we get are absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and it's around relationships. It's around this feeling of being addicted and stuck. Comments that we've heard typically from 20, 30 year pack a day smokers. We're now hearing from 13 year olds. Um, and for those of you who have seen our depression stick campaign most recently, it's affecting their mental health. Um, they're talking about the ways that it's making them feel more anxious, making them feel more irritable. Not shocking, the volume of nicotine that they're using and what we know nicotine does in the body and what nicotine withdrawal feels like. I think it's critical to stay focused, yes, on the gateway hypothesis on smoking and the relationship between those two things, but there's almost an opportunity to sidestep that to focus on the very real present day impact of a chemical that we know has no role, um, you know, except for established smokers, the very small percentage of kids that are smoking to get them off combusteds, but that's not, you know, the, the vast majority of kids that are using these products. If I could just make two very quick points in response to the question. Um, the, I, I absolutely think that people have the capability of getting the nuances. I really do. I, I, I think that um, people are, are not, um, people do not need an all or nothing, you know, message. They can handle the nuances. And if you talk to vapors, and I, you know, I've done many, many qualitative studies with vapors, they absolutely get it. They absolutely understand that uh, vaping, they're doing something which is much safer than smoking, but it's not safe at an absolute level, but it's saving their lives. Um, I think people can get the, 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 the fact that there is a continuum of risk. Um, and then the second thing is that I think ironically, one of the things that's plagued our ability to communicate accurately 
with smokers and with and with youth and with non-smokers is that we haven't been not we but but well we and 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 but in particular e-cigarette companies have not been allowed to market their products for smoking cessation which is actually insane when you think about it because that's their only purpose that's their only legitimate purpose there there's there would be no other possible legitimate purpose for these products to be on the market except to help smokers get off of them um, they have no value as a recreational product in, of, in, in and of themselves. So why can't these companies tell the truth? And we just saw evidence that was presented from the Cochrane Review that it actually is true. These, they do help you smoke. Uh, sorry, they, 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 they do help you quit. So why can't the companies say that? And, and that's a huge problem because we've kind of forced them into a corner where they can't say we're selling these products to help you quit. So what, what are they left with? They have to say, well, these are cool. And, and that's, the, that's what's really gotten us into this mess is that they've been marketed for their coolness, um, which has attracted youth. Whereas if they were just honest, if they could just be honest and say, look, this is for people who are so addicted that they have to use this, this tool, um, you know, this crutch to get off cigarettes, that would not have a lot of appeal for youth. Um, and I think, so, so I think that, that that regulatory framework for advertising is a huge impediment to getting effective messages and honest messages across. If I might just build on that just a little bit, um, the if I think the work that Jamie's doing is key to being able to craft these messages because we need to have the data in order to make the clinical practice guidelines so that clinicians can say this, especially in a public health context, right? Um, the, the the when with that data then the the which is now the tobacco industry who owns a lot of these the vaping companies if they go through the regulatory processes to be able to um uh market their product because we have some rules about that then then that would be a whole different um uh, ball game so i just think that there's still some work to be done you know, in terms of uh, showing strong evidence um, and, and making it into the clinical practice guidelines and um, uh, to be able to market the products the way that we have our regulations in, in the U.S. Um, but you know, Jazz, um, Ali Wala made some comments in the chat that I think are, are of good value. You know, um, not all of these users are the same, you know, and from, from Quitline perspective and maybe from the, the like the truth, we, we get the, the folks who are trying to quit, you know, so that and, and can't, you know, and um, so that can kind of like filter your, um, uh, the way that you look at that data, but that's not everyone, right? There, there are other groups where this, it, it, it's used for different purposes and, um, it, it is, is less harmful to maybe um, physical and, 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 and uh, mental health. So I, I think, you know, really understanding all of these nuances will be key to your question, Jen, of how to, you know, craft these messages. And we're just not there yet. But um, I learned from Jamie, I, I didn't know all those studies that had just come out. So I was very um, glad to see those because now that helps me inform, you know, and, and it'll filter down. It's a slow process, but I think that's all we have, you know, uh, right now. Great, thank you. I wanna to turn to uh, a different topic for a moment, and that is um, marijuana. Amanda, you brought this up. Um, Amer uh, so, you know, the increasing legalization of recreational marijuana use in the US Co-use of tobacco with cannabis, how big of a problem is this? Are these, are, is it harder to reach these uh, people who are using tobacco and, and cannabis? Is it harder to treat them? Um, any comments about that? Well, I, I looked at data from the National um, Youth Tobacco Survey and what's, what I found was really striking is that if you look at youth who are regularly vaping, and I, I, I kind of arbitrarily define that as vaping 20 or more out of 30 days, 
Um, 50% of them are vaping THC in addition to, to, in addition to nicotine. And if you look at everyday vapors, close to 85% of them are vaping THC. Um, so I think we actually have kind of a hidden THC vaping issue, marijuana cannabis vaping issue that has largely gone under the radar screen. Um, and that really needs to be addressed. And I think that what really brought us home was the so-called E-Valley outbreak where we had acute respiratory uh, failure um, due to what turned out to be um, an impurity, vitamin E acetate or an additive to THC e-cigarettes. Um, so, you know, so far as I know, you know, nicotine e-cigarettes haven't killed anyone yet, but THC e-cigarettes have. Um, and so I think it's time to address, it, it is time to address the, the THC issue, um, both in terms of combustible marijuana use and in terms of vaping uh, marijuana use. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo, obviously, our data showed very high rates of co-use of uh, at least past 30-day marijuana use among trial participants. Um, that's an area of interest for us to be able to look at, as I mentioned before, um, the trajectories of quitting alongside e-cigarettes, alongside other combusteds. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge in terms of intervention is obviously, from our standpoint, the work that we do is national. Uh, in scope. Um, the interventions that we deliver are available across the U.S. and there's obviously a very, a very varied regulatory landscape when it comes to uh, marijuana. Um, and, you know, the understanding that young people have about the risks, the benefits, the harms, the, the challenges of, of quitting marijuana, I think, are largely uh, quite small. Um, you know, the, the anecdotally, I can share that we do have young people coming to our program to quit using marijuana. Um, they've self-selected a quitting program, whether they're vaping THC, whether they're smoke, smoking marijuana, um, but where there's interest in quitting as well. And so, I, you know, our hope is that, as I said, we're sitting on a very large trove of data to be able to shed some light on these questions, at least around the, you know, the, the cessation questions. And also just to, to add to what Dr. Graham said, um, there, is, there have now been increasing reports of, of uh, cannabis that's, that is laced with fentanyl. Um, and I'll be honest, as a parent of a high school kid, the thing that, scared, that, would, that does scare me or would scare me the most mm -hmm. if my child was, uh, was likely to use substances um, would be that. I mean, that is the most acute threat to death, I think, that we have among our, our nation's youth. Um, we, we, we are seeing um, amongst both synthetic marijuana, but now among just regular, you know, uh, cannabis, we're seeing non-synthetic cannabis. Uh, we're starting to see lacing of these products with other drugs. And, you, and when you're getting them off the black market, you have no idea what's in there. Um, and this is, I think, another reason why legalization of cannabis is so important, uh, so that at least when kids are getting the, the product, they don't, you don't have to be worried about them dying from you know, a fentanyl overdose. I, this is a real problem, and I think it's going to increase over time. Thank you. Uh, I see we're almost out of time. I, I, I just wanted to ask one last question. And I, you know, these are very controversial topics, and we're living in contentious times. And when I was looking at your CVs before this meeting, I was struck by how many of you are engaging with the public uh, through Twitter or by other means through podcasts, Jamie, you mentioned, um, around e-cigs, around flavor bans, other controversial topics. How, so as someone who is, I've took a step into Twitter, I take a step out, then I step in, then I get, how, how important do you think this is? Is it a bunch of people talk yelling at each other or is this really an important way of reaching the public that, that scientists should be using more? Not necessarily Twitter, but through other, other public engagement. Shall I start? Um, so I, I view public engagement as kind of a moral imperative for the work that, that we do. Um, 
partly because most of it is publicly funded. And so I think you know, the people who are paying for it should, should be the ones to benefit from the results. And because unlike other clinical areas, this is a one where people really are making their own choices for the most part and not necessarily having important discussions with their clinicians. So well, I'm on Twitter, I'm not super Twitter engaged. Um, it usually feels like an echo chamber a little bit to me. Uh, it's not an unpleasant experience.